All right. Well, it's noon here on Wednesday at One Schoolhouse, so it's time for our weekly webinar where we bring you news and insights from the independent school academic leaders community. I'm Sarah Hanawald, the Assistant Head of School for Professional Development, and I am absolutely delighted to welcome Donnie Piles here this week. So Donnie, say hello to everyone, and then I'm going to have you do an introduction after I get our slides going. Sure. Hello, everybody. I really look forward to, um, to speaking with you today. So as I usually do, I'm just going to start with a little bit of some reminders. Today's webinar, the topic is flexing time and space. And we're really going to think about, um, it's not a science fiction episode, I promise. We're going to talk about flexing time and space in ways that are very reachable for independent schools. On our blog right now, we have a piece written by Kareen Dadini, our Assistant Head of School for Teaching and Learning, called Rethinking Time and Space, and it's got an exhortion in it to keep doing it. So um, if you feel like you are really intrigued and you need a little motivation, I think Kareen has got just the thing for you. If you're not on our Academic Leaders Listserv, um, please join us. There's a link under Professional Development on our website, and you can sign up. And it's a wonderful community of academic leaders connecting and sharing ideas and support with one another. And then if you're not getting our newsletter, and if you're not on the listserv and you're not getting the newsletter, I don't know how you got here, but I'm glad you're here. Um, we are using Twitter and Facebook a little bit more to promote our webinars. But if you are not getting our newsletter, please sign up. It's on our blog. So on the right of our blog post, you'll see a sign up for our twice a week newsletter. And then every week we ask a question. And this week we asked something that was uh, a little bit forward thinking, we hope. What have you learned in the past 20 months about informing your use of time and space on campus? And Donnie and I looked at these before and I'm just gonna give everybody a moment to read these because it's super interesting the way that folks answered this question with a lot of, um, diversity in their approach, thinking about our, you know, schedules and thinking about how are we using outdoor space or how are we leaving campus or how are we so happy to be back and reclaiming campus. So a lot to think about in here. And actually it's another opportunity to plug the newsletter because if you're interested in seeing the results of the Pulse every week, uh, we do send them out in our Sunday newsletter last week at One Schoolhouse. Right, so I'm going to stop sharing in the chat. Sienna will be sharing links if you haven't completed the poll yet and you'd like to take it, or if you need a link to any of the resources that we mentioned, those will be in the chat. You're welcome to share resources yourself that you would like to share in the chat. And if you've got questions for Donnie as we're going along, please pop them into the Q&A and we'll be sure to have time for questions afterwards. So. Donnie, thank you so much for joining me today. Can you just tell everybody a little bit about you and your work and how you've gotten to um, the mindset that you're in now? Um, yeah, of course. So <clears throat> um, my name is Donnie Piles and I work at Christ Church School and we're in a uh, boarding, a small boarding school in kind of Tidewater, Virginia. So we're down on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and I know we're talking about kind of time and space, so I want to give a little bit of context because I know that um, context really matters as we try to hear things from other colleagues and then implement changes. I was at a conference one time uh, years ago, and they were talking about implementing a new salary scale for, you know, how they went about implementing a new salary scale, and it was all very impressive. And then I, I asked what their endowment was, and it was a school that had, you know, um, an endowment that was nowhere near what uh, as small as ours was. And so a lot of what they had said kind of went out the window. So the, our school is a small boarding school. We have about 230, 240 kids. Um, we're, a, we're a female and male boarding school. We have about 60 day students from the local area. Um, we've been around about 100 years. So we have, we have some history to us that is challenged as you try to make changes and, and think about things a little bit differently. Um, I have been at Christchurch for 23 years now. I currently serve as the Dean of Instruction. Um, and I've done a little bit of everything. I started actually as an intern kind of right out of college. I've taught 
four or five different disciplines, coached several sports, lived on almost every dorm on campus. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I have lived the boarding school life through and through uh, for, for my entire career. And I understand all the challenges that are associated with it. Um, excuse me. And at the same time, being a boarding school, I think also, also gives us some flexibilities with schedule and, and kind of how we see time that maybe is a little bit harder for a school that is primarily a day school. So um, I know that, that that context can matters. That, I love that. And, you know, Peter Gao, who's often here, who's not um, here today, when he talks about his boarding school, he talks about painting the fences as part of the piece. So you were channeling a little bit of him there when you said lived in every dorm and really covered the campus. And, okay, you've been, You've been up to a lot though in the past few years with some really amazing outcomes. And we were planning this webinar and you said something that I really want to use as a thesis or guiding statement. You can tell former English teacher here. He said, I realized that we should look at the schedule as curriculum. And as we talked a little more, I realized you weren't just meaning any singular aspect of the schedule, but like the schedule as nitty gritty as that how students are spending their day and as blown up as where are they you know, for months at a time. So can you tell me a little bit about how you came to that realization? Yeah, I think for me personally, as an educator, it, it was, it, it was really trying to wrestle both in my own classroom. Um, I have a 15 year old son who's here now as well at our school, but I think it's, it's trying to think about, um, in the, slide you put up before, there was a lot about relationships. So if relationships really are the key of education, which I think most of us in the independent school world would, would have some agreement about, then how do we set up the day in a way that leverages time and space in a way to build relationships and not just um, kind of go throughout their day? A lot of you talked about kind of content as being not as important as the relationships that, that people have with one another. Um, and we, when I started here, Christchurch was a really typical school. You know, we had seven periods of day that were 45 to 55 minutes long. We maybe experimented in like a long period here and there. Um, and I think our first real big question when we started asking some questions about curriculum 15 years ago was the AP. And so we're a school that does not have AP and we haven't had it for 15 years. Um, wow. what, what we think of as a pretty strong honors program um, that kind of replaced that. And once we started asking, so if the AP is not the best way for us to guide students in, in academic engagement, um, why not? And one of them was just kind of coverage of content and, and thinking about the pace of, of those things. And that led us to a whole bunch of other questions about setting up the day and the time. And so we really see or try to see the way we break up time in something as detailed as you said as how much time do they have between classes mm -hmm. as curriculum? So if kids are running around, then they don't have time to build relationships, much less go to the bathroom, um, to something as large as how are we organizing our terms? Are we quarters, trimesters? And what's the pedagogical kind of rationale behind that? And how does wow. that fit into the other things we are asking kids to do? Okay. So... You know, if you think, okay, reconsidering AP courses, if you do an analogy that maybe that's a little bit of um, a one room remodel, you ended up doing more of a gut and remodel throughout the program. Yes. And so what did you decide that you wanted to build in when you well, I think began reconsidering this? As we were talking, we were, we were getting ready for this and I was reflecting a little bit more. I think, you know, I've never remodeled a home, but I, I my dad did. And I remember him starting to knock down walls. And the problem was always that once he knocked down one wall, it never stopped there. It just kept going into more and more rooms and flooring and ceilings. And, you know, it wasn't just paint. It, it became kind of all inclusive. And I think we have found that that is the case for us. And so it is, it is at times daunting to think about it that way, because we do recognize that one of the things we've changed when we started asking questions is the culture around asking questions about how do we do things a little bit better. Um, so that, that's an important part of us. But I do think that there have been some there are there have been and there are some manageable things that you can that we've tackled to try mm -hmm. to do that. And so one of the ones for us, and this is where I when I started about context, the first thing we did is we started the school day at nine o'clock. So we began this whole thing with AP and all this of trying to shift to a place where we were going to let research try to inform what we do. And so, you know, we know that the research is pr pretty clear. I'm a, it's a high school and where I work 
about the, the science behind sleep and starting times and all that. And so we went ahead and did it. Um, I think that might be a little bit harder, you know, in a different context, but we're a rural school, mm-hmm. uh, 75% boarding. The local day population is, is pretty rural, pretty self-employed. Um, and, and I think that really allowed us to do that. And we started at nine for two reasons. One, we wanted to we wanted to kind of lay a stake in the ground that we were going to follow research as we were trying to make decisions about our school. Um, but two, we recognized that we needed to have some time in the day for faculty members to gather. Um, mm-hmm. And so we we had been starting at eight, like a lot of schools. And so we put a faculty meeting time in for people that were interested from eight to nine so that we could begin trying to figure out you know, what we want to do and, and how we might go about doing it. So I think that was one of the first real tangible messages and you know talking about schedules curriculum it it was curriculum in that we were putting a a signpost out there that we Mm -hmm. were we were willing and intentionally going to try to think about school differently um and now you know 15 years later i don't think a nine o'clock start time is a is a tremendously um you know extravagant thing to do and i don't think getting rid of ap is a is tremendously bold any longer um, but 15 years ago, I, it was. Right. And then, so now you're doing something with your feedback week, which I really want you to describe, because I think that's something that would make more people go, oh, yeah. And one so, question led to another, right? Yeah. So everything we did, you know, so if we start asking about AP, how do we want to, how do we, what do we want to have our students be engaged in? And we really, part of our thing is relationships. It's in the, our publishing material, right? It's, we really hit it really hard, like a lot of us do in the independent school world. Well, so if relationships are really the, the kind of the signposts of education for us, then, you know, putting out grades um, every however many weeks with little context or kind of the copy and paste blurbs that a lot of schools do about, about the kids in our classrooms, we really wanted to communicate to our students primarily that learning is different and learning is about growth and struggle. And so we switched to a a trimester um, term because we wanted to have a little more time to build that growth. And in the middle of each of our terms, we take a week out of of the kind of normal pace um, where we really try not to have away games. We schedule only home games during that that week. We really try to minimize the other things going on. Um, And we have two and a half hour classes where each kid meets with their teachers for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, Again, context, you know, most of our classes are in the 15 range. So I think, you know, that matters. Um, And we meet with each kid and we have kind of an, um, we want them to see as an opportunity to really talk, not about what they're, what the content is they're learning, but how are they getting, what are they getting better at? What competencies are they getting better at? And then once we started doing that, then we started thinking about, okay, well, we really want them to have a lead in assignment to kind of prepare for those conferences, uh, you know, kind of a mini portfolio type project. And then we want to have a lead out assignment to get them reflecting on those conferences in some ways. And then the teachers, we want them to write a narrative comment to, that's addressed to the student, but also goes to the parent. So we needed some work time in that for them to do that. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, really we're talking about kind of a three week period and a 12 week term in which we are really heightened on, heightenedly focused on communicating to the kids that the value of education, the thing that we're trying to guide you in is not content, 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 but the the value of education is engaging in relationships with people that care about you and getting better at things. And um, to do that, you've got to fail at some things or at least struggle at some things to then get better at them. And so, you know, it, it really was, it's been an important change for us, but I think it's it's important in what we're truly really trying to communicate to the kids about what this what we're engaged with with them. Yeah, it sounds very kind of Ken Bain esque in the sense of teaching students to to really pause and reflect and connect across curriculum and across their lives to pull all of these things together in order to make their own meaning. Yeah, and just today before, before this webinar today we. Um, every Wednesday, we have what we call community engagement days, and that's a time for students to meet with their advisor or do some other activity. Today, it was their advisor. So we meet with our advisees for an hour and a half to two hours. Um, and today, it was for them to review those comments, to then meet with their advisor, to talk about what their teachers were saying, where they seen trends across classes. Um, so, you know, I, I think a lot of our schools do this type of thing, but I think really 
thinking carefully about the time that it requires to, to do it in a way that actually accentuates curriculum and accentuates um, value in school, I think is, is hard. And, um, you know, we are still challenged by it. We still have teachers that, you know, come new to Christchurch from other contexts that we have mm -hmm. to kind of get on board and help them understand the, you know, kind of our pedagogical and curricular philosophy. Um, and so there's always challenges with it, but I think it's a, an important sign in the, in the yearly schedule of what we value. Really interesting. Are there things that you've seen that are sort of markers that, hey, this is working. I, I see this sign of something that's happening here that, that didn't used to happen. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So we are in the midst of all this. We're also kind of moving in the competency realm, which I know a lot of our colleagues are in the independent school world and elsewhere. Um, but we, we really, in the narrative comments, we've asked our teachers to really build them around the competencies of the course. So, so not to talk about you didn't do that assignment or that assignment, but to really build the comment around the competencies. And so, you know, teenagers being teenagers, um, they tend to, um, I don't know the right turn of phrase here, but, but um, politely mock the things that they're being asked to do. <laughs> um, and so, you know, in the past year or two, we, we've, we have more and more kids talking about the competencies of the school and they're doing it sort of tongue in cheek. Like I'm practicing, you know, effective communication right now, but I think the fact that they are, they are talking about those things, they are recognizing that that language is the currency that we want them to really be thinking about. Um, I think that's really important. Um, the other thing that you know we we have noticed is one of the parts of our daily schedule is we always try to have we always try to have community time in between our class time. So we'll go to class for for about eighty minutes. Our classes are eighty minutes, um, and then after that we'll have some community time. So whether that's an assembly or whether that is uh, we're Episcopal Episcopally affiliated schools, so we have chapel. Um, whether that is advisory time. Um, or whether that's just letting kids kind of hang out and be kids. And so we have like some ping pong tables out in our quad. Um, and the use of that time has become really valuable to the students. Um, and we, last year we had to change obviously like the rest of us. And so mm -hmm. we didn't have any of that. We didn't have the community congregation and our kids spoke really thoughtfully about missing that time as a time to build relationship with one another. And we had been using that language a lot with them. So, you know, certainly our older kids, they, they could reference, not just not getting to play anymore, but that they didn't get to meet kids that they didn't know anymore. And that those were spaces where they had met yeah. kids who weren't in their classes or weren't on their teams or weren't in their grade level. Um, and so I think, you know, a lot of it has been anecdotal, but hearing the students talk about the things that we value in our curriculum and in our kind of, you know, what we want to be in education has been really, uh, really important. And I think sometimes we miss, we miss that as educators. Um, and, and it's been a good reminder to me this year as we've kind of tried to get back to some degree of normality. It sounds like you do a lot of listening to students in your experience too. And I don't mean, um, the a formal structure of, you know, student present to kind of thing, but like, it seems to me like you're doing a lot of the proximity listening and hearing what you're, you're experiencing. I think so. I think we try to listen kind of in proximity and I think we try to listen directly. So again, kind of time and space as a boarding school, um, for those of you that work at boarding schools, you know, that evening routine is always a, is always a balance of how much structure do we give kids um, and then how much do we try to help them get ready for the college experience and give them some flexibility? And so we, um, we used to be like every other boarding, when I first got here, what I think was every other boarding school, you know, two hours of study hall at your desk, you know, and the world has changed a lot since then. Um, and so now we have a, we kind of have an evening routine that talks more about how they are shifting from space and time. So we want a little bit of focus time. We want, to, we want to give you a little bit of time to exercise if you want it. We want to give you some time to wind down to get ready for bed. So we've just changed how we even talk about the time. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge with that, though, is you we're still working with teenagers, who, with parents who want us to deliver a product in some way. And what the parents see as the product might be different than what we see as, as how to get to that product. Um, and so, you know, we're wrestling right now with how do we 
how do we help those kids who are struggling with that change in, in time and put more structure in place? And so we're, we're listening to our student leaders um, to try to get them to see this as curriculum in many ways. And, and they're starting to talk with the kids on their hall about, um, this is not about you know doing X, this is about getting ready for sleep. And so mm -hmm. a lot of it is, you know, fake it till you make it in some ways for teenagers, but I think they're <laughs> using the language that, that we would want them to use as adults. Right. And, um, and I think knowing that, you know, teenagers are teenagers. I love the way that you said that. And I think it's completely true. Something else you said when we were thinking about this conversation, it's you said every now and then things come up like, when do we teach the constitutional convention, right? Yeah. So we've done a lot of restructuring. How do teachers make curricular decisions? And how do those conversations happen on campus? What's that like? Um, so I would, I would imagine that we are not alone in this in that finding time for teachers to meet is perhaps the biggest thing to think about in our time and our schedule. Um, and so as we've gotten away from when, where we used to start at eight and now we start at nine, I think one of our challenges is the adults forgot that we used to start at eight and that that time was professional time from kind of eight to nine. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to rethink you know, how we carve that out in the day. Um, so one of the things that we're talking about right now is, um, you know, do we, can we find a way to have a day much like a lot of us did last year, that was kind of like the work day, you know, when we were doing asynchronous learning, um, right. can we find a way to do that? I think for us, the conversation of, you know, when do I teach the constitution? Um, that's really a people coming on board, the people who have been here for a while or at, after they've been here for a while, I think that conversation, that's not one we struggle with a, a whole lot, but I think it's because we've answered questions before like the AP and we've really moved away as an institution away from content as the, as the marker of success. And so for us, it's a conversation around um, that the constitution or whatever the content is that we're teaching is in service of some other skill that or competency that we're trying to get to. And if we stay focused on those competencies, um, you know, we are, we in high schools are not creating history majors or English majors. We're creating people who can access learning and we're creating, yeah. we're, we're trying to train, we're trying to get students to be able to enjoy learning, know how to ask questions, know where to find answers. Um, and I think a lot of that came, you know, from from hearing our students come back as we really got into this competency and talk about how they felt really well prepared, even though as I used to teach AP US history and then our honors US history, knowing that I left out some content that I thought a history major might need to know. Um, but that's not, you know, I, I don't think that's our role necessarily. I think our role mm -hmm. is to learn how to access information. And so the competency conversation coupled with, well, when do I have time to teach, you know, topic X has been really important in conjunction with one another. Um, so that when, you know, lab, whatever, lab number 30 doesn't get done, it's not the end of the world in terms of our curriculum. That makes a ton of sense. And I, I, I think there's a really nice segue here into um, an activity that you did with the faculty that I really want you to talk about with the transcripts and just where that led in terms of what do grades mean and that sort of thing. Yeah, so in the, in the time where we were really kind of moving into competencies in this conversation around how do we spend our time in our classes with our kids, um, I took, you know, like five or so seniors of ours. And so we're a small school. We have, you know, 60 seniors in our class, in our senior class. We know them or we hope we like to think we know them really well. Mm -hmm. I took five kids in our senior class with varying degrees of um, success or not success. And I uh, printed up the transcripts and I got, got rid of all identifying markers, address, name, you know, anything that would identify who they were as a person. Right. And in a faculty meeting, I handed them out to our faculty and I said, okay, so tell me who these kids are. Um, and we, nobody could identify who they were. We didn't really know who they were. So if, if our transcript just shows, um, you know, a kid's name and the classes they took and the grades they got, um, we here at Christ Church couldn't figure out who they were. So there's no way a college would really, kind of the point that I was trying to help our faculty see was there's no way 
a college would really know who they are. So how do we build in time so that, and, and structures this, hopefully the mastery transcript, but more importantly for our work time so that we can really help students share who they are. Um, and we can really share that we understand who they are as people, as learners. Um, and so one of the things that I'm actually planning, why well, I planned last year and then the pandemic is I was gonna take a narrative comment for a group of kids and get rid of all identifying markers and say, okay, so can we identify these kids now? Mm -hmm. um, and my bet is we probably can't get 100%, but my bet is we'll get a lot better than we did when it was just a class and a, and a letter grade. So I just think that looking at artifacts, I'm a, I really like the looking at student work protocol as well, is something that more academic leaders could do with faculty in considerations of, you know, what are our, what's our vision for the next step? And you mentioned a next step vision and you said to me, um, I don't want anyone to think that a learning management system is pandemic technology. Because yeah. if we go to, you know, a, another country for three months, this is going to be key. So yeah. Do you mind sharing a little bit about that too? Because I'm, no, I'm always I was, on that, was, that wagon. The, yeah, so Sarah and I were talking about, you know, I think one of our, as an institution, one of our biggest mistakes was we did not adopt a learning management system faster pre-pandemic. Um, we have a learning, learning, we had a learning management system, but it's kind of a, and I won't use any, any organizational names, but it's kind of a behemoth. Um, and mm -hmm. it's not really geared towards student learning. It's more geared towards student management. Um, and so when the pandemic struck and we, we knew that we would need a much more robust, robust learning, learning management system, um, I and a couple other leaders, we were really afraid that people would associate a LMS with the pandemic. And that has proven to be true. And it's something that we're really trying to work against. But I, I recognize and, and I think that, you know, if we want to change the time and schedule, if we want to be a school that sees curriculum as accessible to different students in different ways. And we want to be a school that um, allows students to do internships. We're in a really rural area, so that's really hard for us. We want to allow students to go um, live in another area and do work study programs in another country. And LMS is kind of the, the tool that we will need to keep our community together in some way, even, even if virtually. Um, and so for me, it's it's, as I've really worked more and more with it and thought more about it, it is, I think, the key to the next iteration of blowing up the time and space of school and thinking not just about how do we move from 45 minute classes to 80 minute classes, or how do we move from seven classes a day to three classes a day, or how do we change the evening routine, but how do we kind of reconceptualize what it means to kind of quote unquote be at school um, and how can we have a more fluid environment that has a community physically present and remotely present that allows us to be the school that we want to be. I think those are great points. Um, I, I have one question here and if anybody else has a question for Donnie, get that into the Q&A. Um, we've got a couple more minutes, but one of this question is what have you done with grades? Um, great question. So grades, uh, um, I was talking with Sarah about this a couple years ago. I, I was I was fed up with a zero, and I don't know where each of you stand on this, but I, I was just kind of tired of the conversation of, you know, a zero and how does it impact grade and you know all the ramifications of the zero in the grade book. And so we we have started moving towards what we originally called as kind of trend grading, which was this idea of moving away from grades as being a numerical calculation that's kind of set in stone. Mm -hmm. So if, if schedule is curriculum and curriculum is about teaching growth to students, then if a student gets a D, let's say, on their first paper or their first lab report or their first test, um, it's really hard for them to really change that from a, if we are calculating grades strictly on a numerical average. And so we really worked with our faculty to get them to see progress as, as how we deliver grades. And that, you know, that puts grades a little more in the subjective realm than in the, well, they have an 82.2. So that's different than an 82.5, which is somehow a B minus versus a B. Um, and so we've really, we've really worked with getting teachers and students particularly to think about that if they get a D, that's okay, because what we want them to do is to learn from that D or C or B, depending on who the kid is and to get them to see growth and progress as, as the barometer. Um, 
And so we are, you know, we are current, we took all, all of our electives and we got rid of our grades with our electives. So we do all of our electives with pass with distinction, pass or unsatisfactory. Um, we are partners with one schoolhouse, not surprisingly. And so our kids who take courses, AP courses with one schoolhouse, we also count those as electives. Um, so we've really tried to fold in how we how we get students to see their time in school through grades as much mm -hmm. as, as kind of space and time. And that's hard. I think that's one of our hardest things because I think most educators would agree that grades are a very imperfect measurement of student progress and student success. And yet it is the currency that most of the world sees as the product of school. And so we've had to do a lot of conversation with parents and kids, incoming faculty members, um, and get them to see that that does not mean we are holding them less accountable to any sort of academic standard. Right, the intellectual growth is perhaps better represented. <laughs> um, so I think that's tremendously important. And Sienna is gonna drop in the chat a link to a page on our website where we have some previous video videos from the independent curriculum group on thinking schedule change that I think might tie to some of what you were talking about earlier. And it is time to wrap it up, but Donnie, this was a fascinating conversation and really um, excited about having you on in another year and seeing where things go. Great. And I'm, if, if anybody wants to look me up and ask more questions, I'm, I'm happy to help at Christchurch School. I'm easy enough to find out. Sarah, I don't know if you'll put, send out my contact information, but I'm happy to talk with colleagues about you know, the nitty gritty of how we got where we got and the, the challenges along the way. Well, we won't post your email on YouTube because that seems like a recipe for oh, disaster, but yes, underneath true. the YouTube, you can certainly get a hold of us here at One Schoolhouse and we are happy to put you in touch with Donnie as long as you don't have an amazing opportunity for his investment purposes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you You're all so teachers, much. So I don't have a lot of money for investment purposes. <laughs> exactly, we're not good marks for that. <laughs> Thank you. Take care. All right. Thank you.